thanks very much. And uh, before I, I, I proceed, um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, David's um, collaboration in getting me here, uh, Du Yen for uh, uh, communicating with all the emails, uh, and the tech team today who uh, set up the, uh, the installation here. So as a performance artist, I've always been interested in uh, the evolutionary architecture of the body. But what a body is and how a body performs now has become uh, problematic. The suspension performances, I guess, were uh, not about uh, generating any particular meaning. They didn't operate on the level of metaphor or symbol. Rather, they were simply spectacles of sensation. Um, these performances were more about affect uh, rather than generating any kind of uh, particular meaning. Uh, the body counterbalanced by a ring of rocks, one rock for each insertion point. Uh, this performance was terminated when the telephone rang in the gallery. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, the suspension performance in New York over East 11th Street uh, and that was terminated when the police arrested me for being a danger to the public. Uh, we know now that we can plastinate bodies and indefinitely preserve them at a time when we can also indefinitely sustain comatose bodies on, on life support systems. So dead bodies need no longer disintegrate Near-dead bodies need not die, uh, whilst cryogenically preserved bodies um, are frozen and uh, kept there uh, for some imagined future where they might be resuscitated. Um, we can display bodies anatomically in ways that we couldn't uh, display them before. And it was a lengthy process of approximately one year to ensure that he met the true criteria to be the right patient for this transplant. And sure enough, he did meet this criteria. At that time, we described a procedure which would essentially restore everything which was not functioning and appearing normal on his face, which included portions of the scalp through the forehead, the upper lower eyelids, the nose, upper lower lips, soft tissues of the chin, down to the level of the neck, and the underlying structures, which included the upper jaw, bones around the eye sockets, the upper teeth, the lower teeth, as well as the anterior portions of the tongue. Dr. Rodriguez, uh, he suffered a gunshot accident back in 1997. Uh, amazingly, his, his sight wasn't affected. His, he still had his vision, but as you say, he, could, he can now smell something he probably hasn't been able to do, what, for, for 15 years. He is, he's now talking. Uh, tell us about uh, the moment that, that he was able to do these things. So the face from the donor body uh, stitched on the skull of the recipient becomes a kind of third face uh, resembling neither. Um. A team of scientists led by University of Illinois professor John Rogers has created a new, less intrusive way of gathering data from the human body. Unlike conventional equipment that hardwires patients to a stationary machine, the epidermal electronics, as they're called, attach to the skin in the same way you would attach a temporary tattoo. Our thought was that if you could convert the electronics from the rigid boxy form that it exists today into a format that looks like the skin in terms of mechanical properties, uh, shape, uh, stretchability, toughness, uh, then you could almost make like a second skin that would laminate on the surface of the uh, biological skin in a completely seamless, integrated fashion uh, that would be essentially invisible to the user, but able to deliver all of this kind of new functionality. So this circuitry is flexible. It's attached uh, to the skin. It can monitor and wirelessly transmit uh, body signals, either as control signals or just simply for, for some medical reasons. Uh, recently, John Rogers has also developed biodegradable flexible circuitry. If the substrate is silk, if the circuit is printed in magnesium, if the um, 
uh, insulating material is silicon dioxide. It means that this circuitry can be stuck, for example, on the surface of a heart, monitor it internally, and then biodegrade harmlessly uh, into the body. Um, a project that's uh, in, in progress, uh, this little robot took its first steps uh, late last year in Europe. Um, this project is to engineer a robot that is uh, robust enough and small enough uh, to climb up my tongue and into my mouth. Uh, I just have to be careful not to swallow. Um, you know, it's a sort of a, a gesture towards our increasing intimacy uh, with technology. It's not going to be external to the body. One might argue that all technology in the future will be invisible because it'll be inside the human body. Um, in London at Brunel University, I'm collaborating with a, a project called an ambidextrous arm. Now, if you can imagine, um, some fingers can bend one way, the thumb can rotate, you've got a right hand, but they can completely bend the other way, the thumb can rotate backwards, so you've got an ambidextrous uh, design all in one. If you're an amputee and you lost a hand, why not get an ambidextrous one? Sometimes having two left hands uh, might be useful. Um, we did our first uh, tests uh, with this hand uh, in 2013 and, and uh, some simple programming. Uh, this hand was uh, 3D printed um, and it's done in collaboration with some PhD students. Um, and the idea here is not only um, uh, a 3D printed hand, a prosthesis, but also one that's actuated by pneumatic rubber muscles. So this is a soft arm, as well as being an ambidextrous one, and the idea is also to insert a webcam in, in its palm, so it also becomes a kind of disembodied uh, eye that is also functioning uh, ambidextrously. Uh, the first uh, um, prosthesis that was engineered uh, uh, was a, a third hand designed initially uh, as a visual attachment to the body. Um, as it turned out, this was sophisticated enough to get invitations from the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena and the Johnson Space Center in Houston uh, to demonstrate this hand to the extravehicular activity group. It has only three degrees of freedom, but a tactile feedback system for a sense of, of touch. And um, uh, this was completed in 1980. <laughs> goes, goes back a bit. Um, initially, it was just a visual attachment, but here I'm trying to uh, draw with my three hands, each hand writing a separate letter at the same time. I had to keep my two eyes on what my three hands were doing. And also, because of the spacing of the three hands, uh, you had to remember which sequence of letters you were writing, because you were writing every third letter. And because this performance happened on a sheet of glass between the artist and the audience, I had to learn to write it back to front. I only learned to write two words, evolution and decadence, because these were both nine-letter words. Um, a performance uh, where uh, the uh, laser beams emanating from the arms, uh, from the eyes, were directed by optic fibre cables. Uh, this was a performance with the third hand, but the sounds that you'll hear in a moment are amplified brain waves, heartbeat, blood flow, muscle signals, and the sound of the, th the third hand. So this performance began when the body was switched on. <laughs> and the performance uh, was stopped when the body was switched off. Um, the extended arm which is exhibited here, and you can have a closer look at it later, is an arm that extends my right arm uh, to primate proportions. 
It's an 11 degree of freedom manipulator. So you have wrist rotation, thumb rotation, individual finger flexion, but each finger splits open. So each finger is a gripper in itself. And whilst my right arm is extended, my left arm is computer controlled, actuated by uh, a, a muscle stimulation system, sending 15 to 50 volts to my different muscles. So my left arm is involuntarily moving whilst my right arm is extended with the manipulator. This performance was for four hours uh, continuously. We also web streamed this performance. This was in 2000. And um, uh, the 3D model uh, that you saw online mimicked the physical movements of the, the mechanism. It didn't take much imagination uh, to make this um, muscle stimulation uh, control box. The blue switches indicate which muscles of your body you could program to move involuntarily. And by touching the muscles uh, on the computer model, uh, the computer model would simulate the movement that you made. And then a second later, my body in Luxembourg would move involuntarily. So people in the Pompidou Centre in Paris, the Media Lab in Helsinki, and the Doors of Perception in, uh, Conference in Amsterdam were able to activate and remotely control my body. I did have a, a, a head-up display, which meant I could see the face of the person who was moving me. And there were malicious agents on the internet <laughs> who, not believing in the system, kept programming my body over and over again to repeat the same movement. Uh, this performance was for two days, uh, six hours a day, uh, continuously. Um, always interested in insect and animal locomotion, and this is a three meter diameter a robot engineered with the assistance of F-18 in Hamburg, uh, robust enough to support the artist's body the upper part of the exoskeleton enabled me to select the walking movements by making different arm gestures. So the legs were operated by my arms, and this was literally a performance where you took the robot for a walk, uh, nothing else. There were no other pyrotechnics. The robot uh, uh, started to walk. This was the first performance I did uh, wearing any clothing. Um, the reason for this was that when I first got onto this robot, uh, it was hitting the concrete so hard that the shock waves passing through my body necessitated me wearing uh, shockproof boots. And when I realized I needed to wear boots, I thought it prudent to wear clothing as well. <laughs> <laughs> Another kind of uh, walking machine that was engineered was this five meter diameter robot. And that's a robot that's about here to the end of the, the, the room there in diameter. Um, and the, the principle of this is that as I lifted one leg up, th uh, three robot legs lifted and swung forward. So by stepping up and down on the spot, the robot could move and uh, sensors in the chassis of the robot determined which way the artist was facing, and that's the direction the robot was walking. And you could see um, this robot, uh, actually, the first performance was in London, uh, in, in, in Hackney, at Gallery 291, which was a converted church space, and at the time that was the largest uh, kind of gallery space that was available for a five metre diameter robot. A smaller robot, uh, an autonomous one in this case, and uh, this robot has a, a rotating ultrasound sensor. And uh, if it detects someone is in the room, the robot stands, selects from its library of possible movements, performs a choreography for a couple of minutes, and then sits down, goes to sleep, and waits for the next person uh, to come along. Uh, this is a pneumatically actuated robot. It's very noisy.
the idea really was to uh, engineer an actual virtual interface where the mechanical movements of the legs modulated the facial behaviour of the, of the human head displayed. So these combination of wheels and legs that they call WEGS allows the robot to move very fast along a flat surface, uh, but uh, it, it's able to climb over obstacles and walk upstairs uh, in other situations. So robots are becoming more, more robust, uh, more reliable, and these robots now are as well as being uh, uh, a, re a result of biomimicry, um, people are now investigating additional sorts of capabilities. So biomimicry is only the beginning uh, and combining and hybridising these uh, uh, multiplicity of functions generates a very interesting robot. A robot that has no onboard computational capabilities, but it does interesting behaviour because it expresses the complexity of the terrain uh, within which it operates. And this is a, a, a very, very interesting uh, bit of research. Even though this robot uh, even has a handle, um, the mammalian gait uh, that's generated is really seductive and quite, quite uncanny. Um, again, uh, biomimicry, but also uh, able to learn and autonomously operate and, and function in an off-the-road off terrain. And in, with the humanoid robots, David Hansen in, in uh, Dallas, Texas, um, 32 micromotors embedded in the skin of this uh, robotic head can generate uh, pretty much seductively, effectively, most, uh, most of our facial expressions. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, small cameras in the eyeballs of the robot means that it can engage your gaze uh, and also uh, it can speak to you in, 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 in English. Uh, I've always been interested not only in attaching technology externally, but also in going back to 1993 for the Fifth Australian Sculpture Triennale, designing a sculpture for the inside of my body. Uh, this was a sculpture that um, was inserted with the help of a friendly endoscopist uh, 40 centimetres into my stomach cavity. The stomach had to be inflated with air to make this uh, safe to do so. You can see the, the um, uh, sculpture fully opened. The sculpture inside the stomach opens and closes, extends and retracts, has a flashing light and a beeping sound. So you have to imagine this as a sort of a, a, a simple uh, robotic choreography inside a wet and soft uh, uh, part of the body. And uh, here's a clean shot of the uh, inside of my stomach. Um, when we first took these images, uh, what began as an artistic experiment quickly deteriorated into a, a medical melodrama uh, where we discovered a polyp in my stomach uh, fortunately, it was benign. Um, and in collaboration um, in uh, 2005, I think, in collaboration with another artist, Nina Sellers, both artists underwent surgical procedures to extract 4.6 litres of their biomaterial. 
And this biomaterial was placed in a hermetically sealed container um, and the installation was titled Blender. The compressed bottles of air, once every five minutes, were actuated, uh, blending the biomaterial from the two artists' bodies. This was kind of the inverse of the stomach sculpture. So instead of a machine choreography inside a, a soft and wet organ, here a machine installation becomes a host for a liquid body composed of biomaterial from two artists' bodies. And the installation is sort of anthropomorphic in, in size. Um, the ear project was actually an idea that uh, 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 came about in 1996, first imaged as an ear on the side of my head. This proved to be an anatomically unsafe location. Having one ear is good enough, having two ears uh, might have led to uh, a partial face paralysis. Uh, but in 2006, um, and having consulted with other plastic surgeons, I decided that a safe location would be an ear constructed on my arm. And uh, uh, here you see the second surgical procedure. The first one was in inserting an inflating prosthesis that stretched the skin of the arm. That allowed the construction of the, um, of, of the ear. When the ear, when, uh, ear scaffold is inserted within the skin, when the skin is suctioned over the scaffold, over a period of six months you have tissue ingrowth and vascularization occurring. So this ear now is, it's only a relief of an ear. Um, we still have to uh, lift the helix to construct a, a, an ear flap, and then we're going to grow a soft earlobe using my adult stem cells. And when this ear has become a, a more three-dimensional ear, we're going to reinsert the small microphone that used to be in there and internet enable the ear. So if I'm in London, New York, wherever I am, wherever you are, you'll be able to log in and listen to what my ear is hearing. Uh, there'll be a GPS so you'll be able to locate the ear, hopefully still attached to this arm and this body, and you'll be able to, to uh, uh, listen in. You'll see here at the end of this surgery, here we're in actually inserting the microphone into the ear construct. You'll see that even though my arm is going to be wrapped with bandage, even though I have a partial plaster cast, even though the surgeon has a face mask on, he speaks to the ear, his voice is picked up and wirelessly transmitted. So it's a completely uh, plausible uh, possibility. I once uh, showed this ear to my two-year-old niece. Uh, she looked at my arm, seemingly recognised it was an ear because she wanted to examine the side of my head, you know, as if the ear had sort of slipped off and <laughs> found its way onto my arm. The idea here is that we're replicating a bodily structure relocating it and then hopefully rewiring it uh, for additional uh, capabilities. Because really the, the experience of, of, of a self and a body now is very different. Uh, a self is, is, a, is, is a disrupted and dislocated experience. A body is an incomplete and profoundly obsolete biological structure. Uh, we don't any longer operate purely as biological bodies. We operate as a kind of contemporary chimera of meat, metal and code, <laughs> of, of, of biology, technology and increasingly having to manage data streams uh, in virtual systems. So we really have to sort of rethink what a body is and how a body operates. And, um, here you can see the arm wrapped uh, and the surgeon will speak and I think the projector is bright enough that you'll see the, the sound indicated on the, uh, on the transmitter. I, there were some peripheral projects that came out of this. 
I decided to uh, uh, make a sculpture, a four metre long sculpture of an ear on my arm. And uh, for, the, uh, for the lawn sculpture triennale, uh, I was asked to do a performance. So as well as exhibiting the work as part of the, the sculpture triennale, I lay uh, on the sculpture. I had my body smeared with white slip, white clay. And uh, it was a pretty cold day. And uh, my body temperature cracks the clay. Uh, this performance was more about, though, a counterpoint in scale of, of, of a whole physical body uh, counterpointed in scale on a larger fragment of the body, which was uh, an arm with an ear on it. But whilst lying on that sculpture, I decided what would be really interesting would be to suspend my body uh, above the sculpture. And uh, at the Scott Livesey Galleries in Melbourne uh, a couple of years ago, um, uh, the front room contained an exhibition of photographs of past suspension performances, 27 of them. <clears throat> and here the body was prepared on the sculpture uh, and hoisted up only 50 centimetres above the sculpture because I wanted to visually frame uh, the body um, with, with the uh, ear on arm. And as the body assumes, as the cable assumes the full weight of the body because the cable is braided, I knew that it would start uncurling and the body would start spinning. And uh, what I thought, though, was going to be about a five-minute performance ended up being about 15 minutes because the body started to spin in one direction, quickened, uh, slowed down, and then started spinning in, in the other direction. Um, so it took 15 minutes before it, it sort of came to a halt again, uh, fortuitously in the same position as it was hoisted up and then the body was lowered down. So this performance began when the body was hoisted off the sculpture and ended when the body uh, touched down on the sculpture. Imatic Face Station is the revolutionary new way to create 3D facial animation. When you provide Face Station with video of an actor speaking into a camera, FaceStation automatically creates matching facial animation in a 3D animation package, from a smile, to surprise, to a frown. The actor literally drives the 3D character. It's that simple and that amazing. So effectively, a camera is simply uh, imaging uh, the actor's face analyzing the position of the actor's face, nose, mouth, and uh, mapping that onto the avatar face. That was state of the art in about uh, 2000 uh, when I completed my own prosthetic head project. Uh, this is state of the art now. Image Metrics is a markerless performance-driven animation company. We specialize in high-quality facial animation for video games and films. With mocap, markers are placed all over an actor's face, and the actor is then required to perform in front of dozens of special cameras. With Image Metrics, however, there are no markers or special cameras. The actor's performance is simply recorded onto video, and the video is then analyzed by a proprietary computer vision software. Well, the actor is captured on video, and then the video is analyzed by our computer software, and the actor's performance is used to drive any facial rig. The client gets back, animation curves on the rig. What do you think? <laughs> well, I think that they have a long way to go. Hmm, I've seen better. It sucks. Whew. I mean, really? C can we just skip that question? They really, really are bad. Not good. Terrible. Actually, yeah. 
Oh, the real Emily only appears at the end. Pretty uncanny and uh, 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 result. And of course, uh, we can produce any skin now by instantly scanning the face or, or a multiple camera imaging the face. But this skin can be animated and audio visually you would not be able to tell that the face at the other end of your mobile phone was not in fact a real person. I, I, I... <laughs> So the artist is animating the head, getting it to make sounds, getting it to sing um, through a connect sensor, recognising its, its gestures. But what's interesting is not so much the uh, one-to-one the -one mapping of gestures to, uh, 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 to uh, motions and sounds, but rather messing with the system. When the system doesn't recognise which gesture you're meaning and uh, it, it, it uh, creates unexpected possibilities. <laughs> had a head-up display, which means uh, I'm monitoring what the head is doing and, and uh, sort of synchronising gestures with, um, with the choreography of the head. Well, the, the installation is titled um, Extract Insert, and uh, the idea is to sort of mesh uh, the actual space of the gallery with um, a virtual space, in this case sec uh, Second Life, where uh, a person visiting the gallery can be extracted and inserted into Second Life, uh, whilst simultaneously avatars visiting in-world might be extracted and inserted into the gallery itself and being able to interact seamlessly between the two. And because this is in 3D, that more optically meshes the two worlds together. No, actually that's me. <laughs> So one of my favourite parts of Friday night was X in a run walking around with a beer in his hand. I don't know that's <laughs> Robots drinking. No. Thanks guys. <laughs> yeah. I think still art's exploding. <laughs> Gangnam Style. 
So you have to imagine this is a, a three-week installation at the Coventry Art Museum. Uh, and we had uh, about 5,000 visitors to the gallery and 1,000 Second Life avatars interacting. And people are coming in with uh, 3D glasses. So in the gallery sort of space, the experience is, in fact, uh, meeting and speaking uh, with people from other places um, and being optically meshed uh, with them in, in the space. Um, and sort of now finishing off some interesting uh, research uh, ambitiously titled Organ Printing, where instead of printing with cartridges of coloured ink, you can now print with cartridges of living cells and print layer by layer. And in this case, printing a, a small tube, which might be a, a piece of um, artery or, or vein that could be safely uh, transplanted without any immunological response because we're using uh, your own cells to do it. Um, and if we were to be able to provide the full complex 3D structure of a heart um, and the tissue types required, then Hewlett and Packard promises to develop uh, a 3D printer. Uh, here it's printed a, a heart uh, but, of course, that's only half the problem. You would have to uh, place that heart in a vat of nutrients, um, increase the temperature to 37 degrees centigrade, electrically stimulated, provide a blood supply. Hopefully, uh, the heart starts beating, and again, you could transplant this heart. At the moment, there's um, a problem of harvesting hearts, from, uh, from dead bodies, uh, ethical issues abound, but if we could 3D print organs, then there would be an excess of organs. So we'd have a situation not of bodies without organs, but rather of organs awaiting bodies. Um, okay, so in sort of age of body hacking, gene mapping, prosthetic augmentation, organ swapping, synthetic skin, what it means to be a body and what it means to be human and what generates aliveness becomes problematic. We can now remote control insects by electrically stimulating through an 8-bit processor embedded in the brain, say, of a cockroach, we can turn them into surveillance objects. We can grow human uh, liver tissue in laboratory rats, which means we can do pharmacological experiments on human liver without any human consequences. Skin cells now can become sperm cells. We can take the skin cells from an impotent male and turn them into sperm cells. But more interestingly, you could take the skin cells from a female body and turn them into sperm cells. <laughs> so males are out of the reproductive loop. <laughs> and increasingly now, people are becoming uh, internet portals of sensory experience. Imagine if I could see with the eyes of someone in New York, if I could simultaneously hear with the ears of someone in London, while someone in Tokyo is remotely accessing my arm and initiating a task with, with which I could collaborate with my good right arm. Um, you know, your body's sensory experience and, and, and mobility would not be determined by this particular musculature with this bounded skin in this particular location, but rather it would become a fragmented, extended body uh, having a sensory experience that is this uh, combination of um, remote uh, signals. And uh, several years ago, uh, the first twin turbine heart was inserted into the chest of a terminally ill patient. What's interesting about this uh, twin turbine heart is that it's smaller and more robust and reliable than any previous artificial heart. 
but it circulates the blood continuously through the body without pulsing. So in the near future, you might rest your head on your loved one's chest. They're warm to the touch, they're breathing, they're certainly alive, they have no heartbeat. Um, the Alternate Anatomies Lab is uh, a new research lab at Curtin University. We have two research uh, um, fellows, uh, Dr. Nina Sellers, who's had pro-sector experience dissecting human bodies uh, for medical uh, uh, students, and also Christian Cruz, who um, is a cognitive scientist. So you have uh, them and myself uh, collaborating with engineering and computer science and some of the local artists in Perth uh, to produce uh, new kinds of um, uh, uh, prosthetics and new kinds of extensions uh, to the body. So we're really interested in anything to do with the human body um, and especially to do with um, notions of, of, of embodiment, identity, uh, differently enabled, disabled bodies, um, and uh, uh, certainly this is an area now that we need to interrogate uh, more carefully because of the ethical implications. Thank you very much. Stella, that was amazing. I feel a little sick in the stomach, but I don't think I'm alone, right? We have two roving microphones. This is your opportunity to ask questions of Stellark. Um, I can ask questions, but I do that all day, every day. So you do it. You are the creative minds in this room. Don't tell me there is not a single question that you have after watching and hearing something <laughs> like that. Um, our microphones are coming so that we can hear your questions. That was very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, what's next now for you? What's, uh, what's, what's, what are you going to do next? What's up? Uh, well, well I, I have had suggestions for uh, more useful uh, body parts to engineer. Um, I don't think I'll be going, necessarily going in, the, in that direction, though. Um, look, I, what's interesting for me as an artist uh, is that um, we're kind of in the business of generating contestable futures, you know, possibilities that, uh, you know, can be experienced they might be uh, interrogated, possibly appropriated, but yeah, on the other hand, often discarded. Um, it's not, I'm not necessarily sort of project oriented, but rather with a kind of a mentality to be open to, to new possibilities, to new kinds of unexpected collaborations. And, and I think the last uh, uh, day or so with David and the rest of the presenters, has been really stimulating and I'm sure by the end of the weekend there'll be much more specific ideas that, that come out of this. Uh, but yeah, the general interest is, is really in um, uh, how, how do we sort of investigate the body beyond the kind of uh, psychosocial subjectivity that we have done in the last two or three thousand years. I'm very, very seduced by what's called object-oriented ontology, the kind of flattened ontology where objects are as important as anything else, where, 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 where codes are equal to people, where uh, chairs are just as important as, 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 as something that grows and breathes. Uh, in other words, a flattened ontology where we respect every object uh, equally and find uh, an interactive place in it in the world. Uh, so I'm very, very seduced by this. And I've always referred to the body as an object, not as an object of desire, but rather as an object to redesign. <laughs> <laughs> You have the most fantastic laugh ever, Stella. It is amazing. Now, we have two microphones, so there's one that can come up into this section and, of course, over here as well. Please ask questions this evening. 
One question over here. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, you finished with the, the conversation around ethics. And I am, uh, in, as we can uh, continue to enter into a world of robotics where we'll have cars that have to make decisions about um, collisions and, uh, and uh, whether it's, it's uh, better to collide with a couple of elderly people or a car that has an infant in it, for example, how, where's the wisdom coming from to make those yeah. decisions? Yeah, there are, there are two ways of, uh, of, of uh, framing that. Uh, one way is to firstly recognise uh, that humans are very flawed uh, social creatures. I mean, often our behaviour is irrational, it's emotional, and often results in bad judgement. That's one way of, 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 of looking at a human body. On the other hand, we're flexible, we're creative, we justify the biological status quo in other ways. Um, on the machine side, one can argue that artificial intelligence, ethical algorithms might generate machine systems that might make more informed decisions, having a much more uh, um, wider and deeper uh, access of information uh, than, than humans would ever be able to, to, to do or to make. Now, that's the two kind of extremes. Uh, on, the, uh, on the one hand, we can criticise uh, humans as, as um, inherently flawed. On the other hand, we can extol machine systems as artificially intelligent and, being, uh, and able to make autonomous decisions. So how do we sort of merge these two systems uh, to, to result, to, to, to come up with more sort of creative and, and possibly more flexible sorts of outcomes. And, and that's how we have to uh, uh, inquire about this. Uh, we need to sort of try to manage this rather than to kind of get on a kind of an ethical pedestal and assert uh, the biological over the technological or the other way around. Um, for example, I'm not a proponent uh, of the Kurzweilian singularity. You know, uh, uh, Kurzweil thinks that because of Moore's law, because of the increasing power of computational systems and robotics, that suddenly, exponentially, in the year 2040, 2050, all of a sudden, machines take over. Uh, I don't think it's going to be that simple. Um, the future is inherently unpredictable and unstable. In fact, artists generate unstable systems. They mess with the science and technology and they interrogate uh, the, 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 the kind of biological status quo. And so I think what's, what's interesting is really to to see the future as always contestable, always to be interrogated, and that ethics as well as technology, uh, you know, are, they're both unstable systems that are constantly being reconstructed, reconfigured, rethought. Other questions? Yes, here. Can you talk about pain during and after your suspensions and your ear implant? Yeah. Well, actually, the, the, the most uh, difficult project um, uh, was, in fact, the stomach sculpture. Uh, because although it, it looks innocuous, you know, shoving something down, down your esophagus into your stomach, uh, in fact, it's, uh, very, it's quite painful. Because I didn't try to make you know, a small sculpture. I tried to make a sculpture as large as your fist when it was fully opened, but it had to close into a capsule structure that was about the dimensions of, your, of, a, of a large thumb. And uh, to insert that down the esophagus um, uh, was, was very difficult. And of course, your body uh, wants to gag and wants to uh, expunge this object. And that was very, very difficult. It took two days and six insertions to shoot 15 minutes of video. 
of, of which that was a, a small section. And it was the endoscopist who gave up in the end because he could see that we were scraping the lining of the esophagus and producing little bits of blood and he was getting, getting worried. Um, the suspension performances uh, look the most physically difficult because you're inserting hooks into the skin and in many ways they, they are. But, um, you know, uh, I decided when I was going to do this that I wouldn't take any local anaesthetic, that I wouldn't take any kind of medication, that I would be fully aware of, of what I was doing. Pain is an early alert warning system that you're doing harm to your body. If you can't stand the pain, you, you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. Um, the most intense uh, uh, period is uh, when uh, you're fully supporting your weight. So the skin is, so the body is not supported, but rather the skin becomes a part of the suspension uh, uh, um, apparatus of, of, of the body, body in a sense. Um, and the skin is a kind of gravitational landscape. The stretched skin is indicative of what it takes to suspend the body in a 1G gravitational field. Um, it takes about a week to heal from a suspension performance. The ear had other problems. I had serious infection problems, not rejection problems. Uh, whenever you do a surgical procedure, there's a 5 to 10% chance that uh, uh, an infection might occur. I had a serious infection where I almost lost an arm for an ear. <laughs> and for six months, I had to uh, take uh, industrial strength antibiotics. And effectively, I was told that if the, if the infection was not going to be cured after six months, we'd have to uh, extract the ear because I was doing damage to my liver. So all of these projects have, you know, kind of different risks involved, uh, but uh, they were managed as best as possible. And, um, you know, I'm still here. <laughs> 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 Other questions? Yes, over here. Um, I'm just curious about what your position might be on consciousness. Uh, I mean, I noticed mm. that um, you were talking, you know, recently I was reading that Graham Harmon is perhaps toying with panpsychism at the moment. Uh -huh. And how does that translate? Yeah, consci I mean, the, one of the problems we have about talking... Uh, uh, about issues of self and, and embodiment and consciousness is that, you know, we're talking in, in a language that has a certain cultural baggage. Um, so certainly one has to agree that uh, um, uh, uh, an operating body is an aware body because it can respond effectively in the world and, and survive to a certain degree. Um, a limited longevity, I might add. You know, I mean, you're looking at a body that is profoundly obsolete, inadequate, uh, empty. There's nothing inside this body. There are no ideas and images inside this brain. Uh, this body is um, only effective in its interaction with other bodies, in this medium of language that it's communicating in, in the local institutions that it's operating in at this point in time in history, um, that's what a body is. Um, to talk about an I, you know, I am an artist, I come to the Gold Coast, is a radical sim uh, simplification of a complex interaction. Uh, when I say I, this body does not mean there is something intrinsically identifiable as a self uh, or a mind inside this head. Um, so this body is an empty, obsolete, inadequate body. But, but it's effective in interacting with other bodies and what's important is what happens between us rather than what happens within us. And I think increasingly now in, in these high-tech terrains that we operate in, uh, the traditional uh, reflect, reflection uh, and the traditional uh, t 
time of, uh, that we have to ourselves is increasingly diminished. Now, do I see that as a disadvantage? No, I just see that as a, as a, a new way of managing uh, the body in, in, an, in an accelerated terrain of technological devices, which ontologically, if, you, if you're in agreement with this flat ontology, object-oriented ontology that I, I spoke of before, become equally important. So we need not only to make uh, the body more intelligent, but we need to also uh, generate uh, a more intelligent terrains within which we operate in. Um, to speak of consciousness is, is as meaningful as to speak uh, of a soul. It's awfully kind of metaphysically old-fashioned, I think. And the eye was conditional and that was a slippage that language forces <laughs> us to speak. <laughs> Um, other questions? Oh, no. <laughs> no, I say that because a fellow Greek is just about to ask a question. <laughs> but I don't have your laugh. <laughs> but um, look, listening to you and, and looking at your presentation, Stella, um, I saw a sort of strange oscillation between art and science. On the one hand, your artworks, as you say, have no particular goal. They stop and start. They don't aim towards any particular kind of functionality. But on the other hand, you seem to be gravitating towards more and more progressive and expanding and technologically refined um, objects and technologies. And so the science seems to be moving in a direction of hyper extending itself and greater levels of functionality. So it makes me wonder what your relationship to science really is. And so it seems to me that on the one hand you give us an account where progress is at the centre of science, but you don't seem to be interested in progress at all in a way. <laughs> is that true? And if not, what is the similarities and differences between your methodology and that of a scientist? Yeah. Well, well, I guess um, um, I guess I grew up in the, sort of the last kind of breaths of modernism. Um, so that idea of linear progress, uh, you know, begins to sort of, uh, uh, you know, sort of die off as a meaningful way of, of looking at the world. Um, and I have to say that I've presented my projects sort of somewhat logically, but in fact you're right, there's a constant oscillation between uh, the biological, the, the technological and the virtual. And in fact there always was. Uh, the first projects I made in art school were helmets and goggles that split your binocular perception. I did, uh, I began the third hand project before the first suspension performance. Uh, so it's just indicative that, that, that um, uh, I, I was performing with virtual bodies in the mid 80s, uh, you know, far before Second Life and, and uh, uh, you know, some of the the, the online sims that we, we, we can interact with now. So uh, there has been this constant oscillation. There, there isn't a kind of linear, linearity to, to what's happening. And certainly there's a playful um, uh, uh, um, interaction with different media. Uh, and uh, I guess um, uh, uh, a kind of a happiness at undermining uh, conventional aesthetics, uh, but um, th there's, 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 there's certainly no uh, belief in, in, in kind of progress. And, and I think this, this idea of speculating about the future, uh, in a sense, is positing uh, a future that, uh, you know, is before us, but we never kind of attain and I'm not sure whether that's the right approach uh, to take. Um, I laugh at Curtin University's um, uh, uh, slogan. And, you know, we all know a lot of universities come up with banal slogans. And the slogan is, make tomorrow better. So my question is, well, what's wrong with today if we have to, <laughs> if we have to make the, the university better than, than today? 
Um, so, um, no, I don't really believe in progress. There is this oscillation of concerns. And the most irritating paradigm for me is the research paradigm in the arts. And I've sort of talked about this with, with some of my fellow presenters uh, before, that um, we're now kind of uh, producing artists that are embedded in university institutions. Universities don't know what to do with artists. They try to authenticate artistic practice by calling it research. And they want us to publish papers as uh, more uh, appropriate research outcomes. Um, they're very risk aversive institutions. So we know that art can be messy. We know that it can be uh, politically uh, 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 subversive. We know that it can be pornographic. You know, does your university institution allow you to take those artistic risks and, and do those sorts of activities? Uh, and I, I, so I don't like this paradigm of research in the arts. So, and I think the connection between art and science is more a connection between art and technology. So it's more the technologies that we share but use in different ways rather than the methodologies uh, that we incorporate. So a scientific approach is not what I take. I mean, I'm singularly um, unsuccessful in everything that I do. I've made a career out of being a failure. None of these projects have turned out the way that I've wanted them to turn out. Uh, there's been no utilitarian use of any of these things. Um, so, uh, I'm just an artist, and, uh, but I use technology, and I uh, kind of respect the position of scientists using that, that technology in, in different ways. Um, I know we've got a question here, but we'll, can we have a microphone just here? Just here. Thank you. Such a privilege to hear you uh, talk and present that oh, tonight, Stella. Um, on the topic of the body and obsolescence, and of course we're here talking about the future, and um, after your presentation I can't help but cross the topic of death. And I wonder, have you considered um, when your uh, art practice um, crossing over, you know, your art and life might become your lifeline, I guess? So talking about the twin turbine heart. Do you, is there any kind of future consideration for that within your body and your practice? Yeah. No, I wonder why um, increasingly I get questions about my death. <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel terrible saying that, but I think when we all, like it's a really kind of no, cliche no, no. thing to consider the future and death, yeah. but when talking about technology and science and living um, in, in an age where youth and maintaining that is so important, I'm just really interested yeah. on how far you would go within yeah. your own body yeah. and within your own practice. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be flippant, but no, it was, no, 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 it was, <laughs> it was to... to uh, Look, uh, you know, I, I think we have to sort of realise that the, although the body is wonderfully complex and, and uh, you know, we, we've, we've generated this, this culture of, 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 uh, and, and produced these wonderful artefacts and, and social and political systems and, and literature and, and, and visual art, arts. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the body has a limited longevity. Um, if it varies three or four degrees internally, it's in serious health risk. If it lose, loses 10% of its body fluids, it's dead. Um, so do we, in a Heideggerian sense, accept the biological status of the body and authenticate the body's existence on its dying? Or do we examine the body as an inadequately designed um, biological system? and consider possibilities uh, that might augment and extend its, its 
operational effectiveness and so on. Um, so I'm very intrigued by those, those questions. And of course, there are ethical issues because we've already got population uh, that, that is uh, difficult to sustain on the earth. And so if you're going to increase and extend lifespans, uh, you've got to make sure that the quality of life is, is going to be adequate and then you've got to manage the social problems that are going to be generated by that. Um, on the other hand too, uh, I guess artists are now thinking, uh, hey, there's so many ways that one might preserve a body, plastinate a body, uh, compress the carbon from its ashes into little precious stones. Um, there are ways that artists might, uh, might uh, preserve their, their existence in another material form. Um, so I haven't really started seriously thinking about that, but uh, um, yeah, it'd be interesting to sort of plastinate this body and, uh, and insert it into a, a robotic machine system that would, uh, you know, sort of go walk about. <laughs> I, think, I think on that point of preserving Stellark, we might finish there. Please, everyone, can you give him another round of applause?